Hello to everyone joining us for this conversation with the inimitable Ralph Nader. Today's event will be an hour in length. I'll begin with an introduction. Then we will spend about 30 minutes talking about the new book, and then we'll open to questions. If you'd like to leave a question in the comments, please do, but hold until we're about halfway through so that I don't miss any. I'm Sally Halderson, Managing Director of Porchlight Book Company. For nearly 40 years, Porchlight has specialized in selling, customizing, and shipping bu books in bulk to help spread innovative ideas and bring positive change to organizations more efficiently and effectively. The work we do pales in comparison, of course, to the impact that our guest today has had on American business. He is a lawyer, an author, a presidential candidate, social critic, and for seven decades has been a fierce advocate and activist for people and the environment through his work in consumer protection and governmental reform. And that's just a summary of his work. So we are thrilled that he is here to talk with us about his newest book, The Rebellious CEO, 12 Leaders Who Did It Right. This book profiles 12 iconoclasts, maverick leaders from diverse industries who, like Ralph Nader himself, refuse to toe the line, to be defined by the status quo, and whose stories should and will inspire the next generation of leaders to be rebels. A line from Shakespeare's The Tempest reads, what is past is prologue. And this book and the energizing stories within will serve current leaders as a guide toward making future decisions that don't just benefit the bottom line, but that build a better tomorrow. Welcome to Ralph Nader. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you for joining us. Very excited about this book. Congratulations. Uh, do you know um, which book in the long list of books this is? What number it is? I've lost count. Somewhere in the 20s. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and, a, and a regular weekly column since 1971. Go to oh. nader.org. Nader you get it free. We'll definitely visit there. That is, it's an impressive bibliography and you've written so many over the years. So why this particular book and why now? Because I think the big CEOs of the big global corporations are really out of control. They have so much control. In fact, in a Business Week poll 23 years ago, uh, over 70% of the American people thought that uh, big business has too much control over their lives. And that control has gotten worse in the internet, not just with kids, right. uh, but also with more fine print contracts and more power over government and new technologies that are not properly evaluated and so on. So the question is, what yardsticks do we use mm -hmm. to evaluate them? Their yardsticks are, hey, what are you, what are you bothering us for? Uh, we meet the market. We meet the market demand, say the opiate manufacturers, you know, right. we meet the market demand. Yep. And so the plastic manufacturers, now we meet the market demand, says Wall Street. The problem is they control so much of the market. Every time there's corporate crime, it distorts the market. Deceptive advertising distorts the market. Uh, monopolistic practices distort the market. Subsidies by big business distort the market, disadvantaging small business, and on and on. So I wrote this book, We Need New Yardsticks mm -hmm. from Past Behavior. CEOs who focused on profits, but not at any price, not at any cost. They reversed the business model from, hey, here's a great idea. It's going to make a lot of money, and then we'll adjust the workers, consumers, and uh, environment accordingly. They did the reverse. The best example in terms of people knowing mm -hmm. was Herb Kelleher of Southwest Airlines. Right. When he started it, I was amazed at how friendly people were behind the counter. They, they yeah. went overboard to say yes to you, not like Delta or others who say, no, that's company policy. You can't yeah. do that. And so I called up uh, Herb. Everybody called him Herb. And <laughs> I said to him, uh, you know, I really uh, commend you for putting consumers, air, airline passengers first. He said, I don't put them first. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Did I hear you right? You didn't put them f first? He said, no, I put my people first. Mm -hmm. Never use the word workers or associates like Walmart. 
I, and he said, if you treat the people in your company properly and well and motivate them and give them security and yeah. let them use their own judgment, not tie them up in bureaucratic protocol, they will treat the customers well and that will get more revenue and it will help the shareholders. That's what I mean by reversing the business model. There, that's a really good example of, of how you treat the stories and the profiles in the book where you're really interacting um, with these stories and with a lot of these leaders, whether it's you're engaging with their philosophy on the page here or you actually were engaging with them over time. And so I'm, you brought up uh, Southwest Airlines and I'm interested in, um, we know that, that COVID really you know, took a whack at the airline industry. And that put pressure on them to make different decisions than they may have in other cases. And so when you tell the story of a CEO um, like Herb, who I'll take the, I'll take the opportunity to call him Herb too. Um, when, when he was running the company, but now the landscape or the company has changed, mm -hmm. we can still learn from the decisions that they made, right? And mm -hmm. I think in with business literature, we often see um, books that highlight or, or offer case studies of companies. I'm thinking of the book In Search of Excellence or uh, Good to Great, where you know there's a lot of critique that says, well, that company is no longer good or that company didn't didn't follow through with, with what they were doing when the book was written. But here, this book is talking about past decisions as a way to propel future decisions, right? Yes, and, and you're also implying the question, is it replicable? Mm. Or is it just based on the personality and character and the upbringing of the CEO? Well, it is replicable. Why? Because they put profits right on top of their table in mm -hmm. terms of goal. They said, without profits, we couldn't do all these good things. We couldn't give to good causes. We couldn't speak up on public justice. I mean, Gino Pellucci spent time springing prisoners from jail who were railroaded into jail. That takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, Anita Roddick of uh, The Body Shop, oh mm -hmm. my goodness, there's nobody like her. Uh, it's, I mean, she was, it was so tragic when she died of hepatitis. Right. The, uh, 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 she had a range globally of where the world should go, mm -hmm. and what body shop should do. She would insist that, that the workers work on their chosen civic causes on company time. She would badger them. She would give them, what do you need? Posters? You need the, you know, stickums? What do you need to go out there uh, and get, get things changed in the community? Uh, so obviously there is something to the charisma of these, mm -hmm. but the model is really repl replicable because it's a profit model. It just right. has different predicates leading mm -hmm. to the profits. I was I had noted here um, you brought up Anita Roddick and um, I have a couple quotes that you included in in your chapter on her that um, she considered quote business was a means to seize every opportunity to do good in the world, and if we take money quote from the community then it is an obligation to not ignore the existence of that community. And did she I, ever prove that's it? really profound. Yeah, she really proved it. She practiced what she preached. Mm -hmm. And all the way to places like the Amazon, where she got raw materials and didn't disrupt tribal uh, customs, uh, all the way to Romania, where she discovered uh, a huge orphanage, that all these little babies were left after the fall of the communist regime, mm -hmm. yeah. no food, no health care. She just hired health care workers, cleaned the place out, they helped these little kids, dressed them nicely. Mm -hmm. And she didn't just go back to London. She she created a trust uh, right. to, to support them as, as they grew older. So she was really one of a kind. She went after her own industry, the beauty industry. There's some dev <laughs> devastating quotes in the book. There uh, really are. And she says, what is beauty? Beauty is in the personality, it's in the character. They're, they're torturing women and young girls mm -hmm. in the industry. I have no use for them. <laughs> By the way, that's one of the characteristics of the CEOs. They weren't right. afraid to criticize their industry. Right, right. And I think that's, um, 
something that we don't see a lot of now, and I'm actually going to jump to a question that that Joy left in the comments, just because that it was also one I wanted to use, and that's a good opening, is whether there's a CEO today that's willing to do what you just said, is willing to criticize their own um, industry, and could that example be a re re included on this list of rebels if they were to make some small changes? Well, they do have to be a certain size, Sally. There are a lot of great small businesses all yeah. over the community. Uh, these were not gigantic, but they were pretty mid-sized uh, companies. And uh, it, it's really, it's hard to find them. I mean, I'm not the best person to answer because you got to really scour the terrain to find mm -hmm. them. Now, some of them, uh, they sold their company to a larger company, right. but they're still doing the subsidiary. They, you know, they're selling good yogurt, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some entrepreneurs, they haven't yet reached the stage of these companies who are trying to do the right thing. But I don't want to rush to conclusion, but it's hard to find mm -hmm. another dozen like this. Uh, the pressures of conformity uh, the pressures of short-term quarterly earnings, pro, uh, you know, stress by Wall Street brokers right. calling them is, is very disturbing to their ideal approach to their company. I was interested in that um, and had that as one of my questions about whether the size of business matters and that um, it can be perceived as being easier to have um, I think the phrase you used was a socially sensitive company that is smaller, doing the right things within the scope of of what they're what change they're able to bring. But really, it's when we're starting to talk about the the companies that have and the leaders who have immense amounts of power and what they can do with that power to create positive change, right? Yeah. Well, the bigger they are, the more they remote they are from where the where okay. the Mm -hmm. transactions and the sales occur. And so they don't get enough feedback. They start thinking they're like emperors are surrounded by sycophants, unbelievable perks. Like, for example, the first woman to ever head GM, Mary Barra, yeah. uh, she's, she's an engineer. She's also the highest paid GM executive ever. She's made $29 million plus ample perks and benefits. Mm -hmm. now, look, she's, had to, she's had to virtually close down her self-driving car cruise in San Francisco because it bumped into her obstructed traffic. Her chosen CEO uh, left under pressure. Uh, she sold all of 20,000 electric vehicles in the last quarter compared to te Tesla selling 460,000. And each year has been around for a long time. It had an electric car 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. why, oh. is she, why, is she, why is she so unproductive? Uh, is she overpaid? Yeah, I guess she is overpaid, like 20, 22,000, 20, Ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars an hour or whatever uh, on a 40-hour week uh, but she's too remote from what's going on and uh, so the, the electric car business of gm fumbles and stumbles and mm -hmm. recalls the cars and so on so bigness makes it more re remote less likely for candid feedback mm -hmm. and they they think they're stuffed shirts you know they're getting all this pay they must be worth something right and uh, Whereas uh, these never lost the touch of the level where they were selling their goods and services. Gino Pellucci, who uh, started 70 companies, he'd sell them off. He was starting companies in his 90s, selling Chinese food and other products. Uh -huh. He had restaurants. Number one, he would always admit his mistakes in public. That's another characteristic of these CEOs. Mm -hmm. They don't cover up. They, they admit their mistake in order to quickly correct it because of the feedback and the pushback. But he uh, he was so hands-on, it was amazing. He insisted that his workers create unions. I said, what do you mean? You know, we're doing okay. You're gonna create a union. And he loved to bargain with unions mm -hmm. and 55 years of business never had a single strike. In the the section on on Gino Pellucci, first of all, I have to say, you know, I've been reading about leadership for the last twenty years, and I grew up in Minnesota, and I had never heard of him, and yet you label him here in the book as um, the number one, perhaps the number one overall entrepreneur 
in the world. And as you just said, he was so willing to, um, I mean, he was obviously very outspoken as a person, but he was also really willing to identify his own failures. And his, the quote that you include is that failure for him was another opportunity to bounce back. And I think that um, I'm so glad you introduced him because this is the kind of um, industry that's happening that we don't really see yeah. surfaced and explored. Well, a lot of these CEOs never forgot where they came from. Mm -hmm. And he came from the Iron Range, as you know, being in Minnesota. Yeah. And it was a very impoverished, the way they treated the miners in the mm -hmm. early part of the 20th century, he, he, he was very clear about that and yeah, talking he was. About it. and uh, so the th this book is perfect for leadership training now that you mention it mm -hmm. it's designed also for millions of business school majors in colleges universities community colleges all over the country because they don't have material like this by which to evaluate the industries and commerce that they're going into mm -hmm. As a result, they accept the mores and the traditions and the uh, mess uh, without having a framework or reference. This gives them a framework. No, you don't, you don't have to have this happen in this company we're working in. Look what uh, look what uh, Bo Rappaport did for mm -hmm. National in American Income Life Insurance Company. He actually insisted on a union and joined it himself. Now, a union in the insurance company industry is almost unheard of. I mean, and, and that's what he did. Every Saturday, he would call his general agents one by one every Saturday morning. So he kept his hands, hands, on, on. Mm -hmm. hands on. But he also was all over uh, philanthropy. He mixed it up with politicians, supported candidates, opposed candidates. Uh, he was a very a gregarious type person. Mm -hmm. uh, and but so that it's important for these business students when they go into their line of work to be able to give standards uh, of higher performance by executives who met the bottom line. I think the, um, I, I was really intrigued by, by how you approach this book because um, I think you're, you're well known as being a critic of business, but here you're a cheerleader of these these leaders who did the right thing. How did you think about um, maybe writing this book as a critique of of leaders today who are not doing the right thing, or what? Did you feel more compelled to provide this framework for future leaders? The last, mm -hmm. to provide a framework. In fact, one of my potential agents for this book, the publishing agent, turned it down because I didn't have enough criticizing big business. And yeah. I said, well, hey, I've got books that will fill a library, <laughs> articles. <laughs> my, it's my whole career right there. We it's want something else. To focus exclusively on how they did it and why they did it. They asked the question, why does business have to do so many damaging things? Mm -hmm. Why does business have to mistreat their workers or underpay their workers like Walmart? Uh, and uh, so there is, there is a philosophic content to these people. In fact, uh, uh, the head of Midas Muffler, Gordon Sherman, mm -hmm. he was a classics major at University of Chicago, and he kept uh, expanding his franchise shops, and he would give uh, his uh, recruiters the following instruction. I, I want to hire PhDs in classics to run my mm -hmm. Midas Muffler shops. <laughs> and he would explain why. Right. He, gave a, he gave a speech uh, just before he passed away uh, at Berkeley in, mm -hmm. in my uh, Sister Laura's anthropology class, she's taught over 60 years in anthropology at Berkeley. It is the most brilliant insight into business practices I've ever read. And I excerpt a lot of that uh, mm -hmm. in the book. Uh, and did he have a frame of reference? Yeah, he had the wisdom of the ancients. That's right, right? I think um, the, when you, I have too many things. I have so many things. So with, um, I'm going to try to find my quote here um, from Midas that 
I am not finding it here for some reason. Uh -huh. But okay. what I'm thinking of is he's he again was a critic of his own business where he um, the quote is something about um, owning a friend or uh, being a franchise business is essentially uh, a take on feudalism. I think yeah. something to that effect, right? Yeah. And that is so revealing that that he was able to accept the premise of of the business and yet try to sculpt what that looks like into something that isn't abusive, like an abuse of power. Well, he tried to write fairer franchise agreements between mm -hmm. his company and Midas Muffler Shops, but he wasn't fooling himself. He wasn't right. kidding himself. He's look, they're inherently one-sided and tyrannical and take it or leave it uh, agreements. Yeah. And that's why that's why he had that broader frame of reference. You mm -hmm. see, but the, the one person we haven't discussed, I called the greatest CEO of our generation, Ray yeah. Anderson. Ray Anderson. The, the founder and head of Interface Corporation out of Atlanta, mm -hmm. the biggest carpet tile manufacturer in the world. And about 1994, he went to a lecture by Paul Hawken, another CEO mm -hmm. who's in the book, who wrote the, the, the famous book, The Ecology of Commerce, basically telling business, you got to shape up here. The planet is running out of time and toxic pollution and global warming, all these things are going to undo everybody, including you. Mm -hmm. And so he comes back to his office in Atlanta and brings his assistants and around. He said, we're changing the whole company. So what do you mean? He says, we're going for carbon neutrality. We're going so we are going to take out of the earth no more than we put into it and then mm -hmm. go beyond that. And by the time he passed away from prostate cancer, he was well on his way. It was 2011. By 2019, right. Sally, Interface became carbon neutral. And now they're going for carbon negative. That's incredible. And I think that's, um, I think, what did he, um, he was asked the question of, you know, what is inter its Interface was his his company and, and what is Interface doing for the planet? And he didn't have an answer for it. And instead of being defensive, he invested his time to research and become so educated and inspired by Paul Hawken that then he set these audacious goals. Well, he was an engineer and he, unlike a lot of engineers, he was humble and kept teaching himself. Mm -hmm. He wrote four books that are really tremendous to this day about climate and global warming and so mm -hmm. on, industry. And he, he, he printed a, po a poem, which I reproduced in the book, by one of his assistants. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, there's no way to describe it. It's so beautiful about tomorrow's child. Yeah. And then look at the way he thinks compared, say, to the arguments of you better be concerned about global warming because carbon dioxide buildup. On page 79, he had a whole list like, oh, here, here's, uh, here's tomorrow's child. Uh, um, well, the, uh, this is the poem, but he basically said, you advance or retard the fate of the planet one, one item at a time, one songbird at a time, mm -hmm. one entire world species at a time, one poverty-stricken, starving, diseased, or exploited human being at a time, one advance of herbal sprawl at a time, one more ton of spent nuclear fuel at a time, looking for a safe and secure home for 240,000 years. One misplaced kilogram of plutonium at a time. One poorly designed carpet at a time. That's how you destroy the earth. Then he had the positive ones. You know, one tree planted mm -hmm. at a time. Isn't that nice, the way, the way you did it? It's a, you know, not everybody accesses um, reality, I suppose, in the same way. Some people, you know, do it via statistics. Some people do it poetry. And and one of the great things about this book is that you also include so many different ways of these people communicating, whether, whether you know, you exchange a phone call with them or it's a speech that they gave, that it is a very holistic look at who the person is, um, 
as a human, and then how that they how they have been able to um, create a company that reflects their own humanness. Mm -hmm. And I think it was um, Paul Hawken. I have uh, I'm familiar with Hawken. Uh, we included his book "Growing a Business" in the book we wrote of the hundred best business books of all time um, quite a few years ago. But he he is obviously uh, been a prolific author. He's been the you know he's been featured on a lot of shows and everything. So most a lot of more people are familiar perhaps with him. Um, but as you say, maybe not as many as as should be. Um, but he says, uh, I want to demystify, not with a set of dictums and executive summaries, but with a book that illustrates how the successful business is an extension of a person. Can you talk about that a little bit and how in, how inspiring that is, not only that the business is an extension of the leader, but also the business is only exists through the consumer who is putting money into the business. And that money that's being put into the business should be used in a way that that consumer might intend. Exactly. Like there's a trust uh, fund. There's mm. a tr instead of turning money they get from consumers into products that are harmful or uh, ripoffs in the financial industry, uh, that money should be seen as a trust fund uh, that the company's a fiduciary of to make it uh, in, invest in the best possible way. Oh, yeah. yeah. But then there's Devon Chouinard, who <laughs> he, he, his first book was Let My Surfers Go. Mm -hmm. he, he wanted the workers during lunch hour off of Santa Barbara to go surfing. And he, he said all these uh, CEOs wanted work to be fun. Mm -hmm. A really a desire to go to work every every day, right? And, and to bring your conscience to work every day, mm -hmm. and to your, your judgment, and not tied up in knots every day. And, and now he gave the whole company a year ago to a trust, uh, and and to perpetuate uh, the mission mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, Patagonia, which is of course uh, to protect the public lands, to expand the parklands, and the grasslands and the ocean, protect the ocean, and to produce products that will last. So, I mean, what company do you know puts ads out saying, don't buy our products if you can repair the ones you already have? Right. And they have a little truck they send around the country teaching people how to repair things, not just their products, all kinds of things. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable uh, company in, in 2012, he wrote a little book called The Responsible Business. Mm -hmm. Some people think is oxymoronic, but he, he he demonstrated that you not only do the right thing, but you condition your own suppliers to do the right thing, to use less w wastewater, uh, to to be more ecologically minded if they're going to sell to you as a as a supplier. This, this, a this is a book for bulk purchase. To yes, use let's just, we so, need to spread the word, right? Book clubs, um, libraries, and schools, your favorite social studies teacher, your business professor. Yep. Yeah. The, um, there is, when you write about Schwinnard um, setting out to create a responsible company, and you write uh, that that quest will always be imperfect, an imperfect but daring process of becoming. Oh, no. Did we lose? Oh, somehow it looks like we may have lost our connection. Hopefully he'll pop back on. Um, but I'll invite people now, we're about halfway through, if we wanna invite people now to submit some comments or questions. I do have some here uh, queued up and hopefully we'll get Ralph back. And we can start asking some questions for him. So if you want to add any comments or questions, please do that. It did look that maybe the connection was coming in and out a little bit. So hopefully they'll be able to Okay, now. Be engaged. There you are. <laughs> okay. Hello. 
Yeah, as, as, as I, I was saying, uh, they had different personalities for sure, but they had very common character. Character. Mm -hmm. the, the Greek philosopher Her Heraclitus once said, "Character is destiny," and I added. Personality is decisive, as we all know in the workplace. <laughs> yeah, um, I have I have so many so many more questions that I can ask, and I've I've while you were off for a moment there, I did um, ask people to go ahead and and write their comments in the chat, and we we will definitely um, there was a segue in there that we could um, go into, but I want to pause um, for one moment and ask you about. I, you mentioned this actually at the beginning, and I just want to revisit it, that that doing good is not restricted to a certain kind of personality or, or someone with a certain amount of charisma, right? Like we don't need um, flashy, uh, self-celebrating people to be doing this work, but that we need in every... Um, type of organization. We need commitment, whether it's um, something audacious, like what Ray Anderson committed to, or something that Robert Townsend did where he was reinventing the organi organization from within and really concerned, as you were just talking about, about people bringing, um, being able to, all of the employees being able to bring their own well, energy and power to the organization. One thing is they didn't overpay themselves. They wanted to set an example. When Bob Townsend was offered to head Avis, they wanted to pay him, I don't know, 55000 at the time. And he mm -hmm. said, uh, I, I, I'm not worth 55000 you know, pay 35 or whatever. Yeah. And the, the other thing that's interesting about them is that um, they didn't want to buy uh, into conglomerates. Mm -hmm. uh, when they would say to Herb Kelleher, you got airplanes all over the country wouldn't you have like to have a hotel chain so what do i know about hotels right. Why should I a hotel to leave it to somebody to have a hotel of, of hotels so they, they weren't expansive in that sense but they did some of them tried to proselytize industry nobody gave more speeches than ray anderson all <laughs> over the country in the world and john bogo the founder of vanguard coming out of a thesis he wrote at princeton university as a senior on mutual funds he broke the fee structure of mutual funds. It took a while, but even Fidelity started lowering their fees. Mm -hmm. Over time, these fees eat up a huge amount of the investment asset value of small investors. And he, so he created a mutual company. Technically, if you put your money into money market accounts right. or you buy mutual accounts, you're an owner, part owner of Vanguard. Uh, it, so he wasn't bothered by Wall Street ca calls and stock prices. And, mm -hmm etc. He could concentrate on serving. And Warren Buffett said he is one of the few people who has actually revolutionized his entire industry. And uh, he wow. did it in, yeah. very, in a very friendly way. Everybody loved Jack Bogle. And his last book was called Enough. And it was a message to the business community. You got to know what enough is when you're making rich amounts of money. You got mm -hmm. to stop develop a perspective and a philosophy and he'd have all kinds of quotes from ancient times uh, to, to buttress his points and he gave a copy to every uh, staff member of vanguard before he passed away i am wondering you know there's there's a lot of material i even have read some books this year that uh, people are arguing that leadership is an antiquated antiquated concept um, that it's overrated, that uh, the internet has democratized information so that hierarchy is now defunct. What do you make of that and the responsibility of, of um, CEOs and business runners to take a role in embracing what leadership is in terms of responsibility and pressure and privilege? Well, leadership is always necessary. Anybody who says we don't want leaders, we want to sit around in a circle and uh, engage in consensus uh, doesn't understand uh, how things get done first and then people learn from the first responders or first creators i've always said in my civic activity that the purpose of civic leaders is to create more leaders not more followers but you have to be a leader to start with mm -hmm. uh, and you're denying uh, unsurpassed human creativity when you say well we don't believe in leaders because that produces hierarchy no 
what they did was uh, they de they devolved a lot of authority and judgment down the path in their businesses. That's why it was su such a wonderful thing to interact with the people who are serving uh, mm -hmm. you because they, they didn't just automatically say, so no, it's company policy, can't do that. Right. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll get to some of the comments in the chat. And that is, um, how might you apply the actions of the leaders that you profile here to the technology leaders of today? I'm thinking of the I was thinking of the the revolutionary way that John Bogle changed how average people could safely invest. What if we had a social media CEO or um, a technology leader that actually wanted to create a safe way for people to to interact online? Is there an appetite for that now? Is there enough advocacy for protecting users as you did protecting consumers? How do we apply these lessons, this framework to tech? Well, the greatest consensus in this so-called polarized country, which is a, a, a strategy by the ruling classes to divide and rule us, red state, blue state, conservative, <laughs> liberal. When you're down to where people work, live and raise their families, these ideologies don't mean no much. They all want the same thing. They want good public services, good schools, health insurance. They want safe products. You know, they want all, all the, the same things. And, and so the, the, the net result of this is that the Internet is, is a kidnapping uh, structure. It, it's kidnapped our children like no one since slavery, five to seven hours a day. It has taken these kids through the iPhone and it's seduced and addicted them, exposed them to harmful ads and service services, junk food, junk drink, violent programming, narcissistic hate exchanges uh, by anonymous people against them, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and taken five to seven hours a day, according to the studies, separating them. Just think of this from their parents, their mm -hmm. community. And nature. Where do you see kids on the sidewalk? You hardly see them playing on the sidewalk anymore. They're all looking at screens and virtual reality, and, and therefore they're growing up without in, engaging reality, which is why my sister wrote the only book I know of directed toward tweens called You Are Your Own Best Teacher, sparking the curiosity, in, in, in imagination, and intellect of tweens, because you know how idealistic they are how solution oriented they are. Uh -huh. Why do we have to have poverty? Why do we have to have wars? You know, they, they ask the why. Right. But uh, what's happened is that uh, it, the, these uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies are out of control. Uh, you have bills passing unanimously in Louisiana and California to try to rein them in. That's a lot of conservative and liberal. Doesn't matter. You have Zuckerman of Facebook testifying, yes, we're not going to go below 13 age, the age level. And then his people are going to the 10, nine year old age level and making him click on fine print contracts that tie him up. Mm. And it's just out of control. And now they have artificial intelligence and they have these apps. And they put all these uh, ads saying, here, mother and father, here are apps where you can control the time. For the, well, you know that's not enforceable. As long as that phone is in the hands mm -hmm. 7, of that child, uh, so they have basically begun to raise our children. And, and, which was a, Susan Lynn, the Harvard psychologist, just wrote a book called "Who's Raising Our Kids: Big Tech, Big Business, and mm -hmm. the Future of Our Children." This is very serious here. Uh, it, it, it harms their schoolwork. It, it leads to depression, discouragement wrist slashing, there's suicides that occur, uh, and we've got to come to grips with it. And we need the kind of CEOs, like you point, to break into that internet gulag, as I call it. There are, there are more wars to be fought, aren't there, in so many different fields. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to switch over to our comments here. Uh, Susie Singer Carter has been uh, submitted a question a while ago. She says, I'm currently producing a film no Country for Old People, with the national consumer voice about the privatization of nursing homes, which has become the standard. Do you see a real solution? 
Well, our first nursing home book was over 50 years ago by high school students. They went and worked as volunteers in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then they came down in the summer. They wrote the book, One Million Americans Who Were Then in Nursing Homes. They testified for the Senate and the House. That's when Congress worked a little bit more for us. They went on TV and radio, and they began generating pressure to reform nursing homes. But, you know, nursing homes are owned by fewer and fewer giant corporations, except for the religious orders that have nursing homes. And it is terrible. It's terrible the way they're treated. There's often the pharmacy down the street that's owned by the nursing home. So there's over-medication. There's a... Uh, there's an atmosphere of just waiting for uh, the end Mm -hmm. and not tapping into the wisdom of these elders and how much they love to to cuddle their youngsters. Mm -hmm. uh, The way we segregate uh, older people in this country is unknown in what was once called primitive tribes. They never segregated. Uh, This is a recent feature of industrialization. And so there are reform groups uh, that you can find uh, that uh, have a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, there are some really good nursing homes, yeah. often, often by uh, religious orders right. that are, you know, a, a, a yardstick. Uh, but we, we have to change the way the workplace operates that mm-hmm. forces uh, parents with children not to have the time or the money to take care of the grandparents in extended families. And so they are warehoused, sometimes uh, to the sorrow, very deep sorrow of the of of their uh, children, mm-hmm. growing up children. Uh, we need to have a conversation on this. That's why Andy Shalal is the only retailer in the book, and he has five restaurants called Busboys and Poets mm-hmm. in Washington D.C. And they're like community centers where issues like this can be discussed. You walk into a restaurant. There's a bookstore, an open air bookstore. And then there's a dining room. Then there's a room for civic and political presentations and poets and music. And while you're dining in that room, you're participating in democratic discussions. And that that has that could be one of them right there. We need more of these kinds of community uh, multi-purpose centers uh, run by small business. I'm glad you brought him up. That was. Um... That's another really intriguing um, example of someone who's who's taking the best of a number of different um, parts of our culture and our society and bringing them together so that we can have these conversations with with food and art and other people. And as you talk about the segregation of uh, whether it's kids on phones or or our our parents in in. Um, nursing homes, this this separation, that this is an opportunity to bring people together. Very much so. That, 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 that's what they like to do. They like to do that. And there was no one better than that than uh, Saul Price. Uh, he, he exhibited another characteristic of these CEOs, anti-secrecy. Mm-hmm. He would invite his competitors or they would invite themselves and say, Saul, you originated the big box store You've got a shrinkage level under 1%. How do you do all these things? He'd share all his ideas, which would be unheard of, but big, big business, trade secrets and all of that. And and he also uh, took a section of San Diego and tried to completely revive it in a systematic way. He would say, what does a, a community in a city need? Well, you know, they need a healthcare facility, they need a library, they need recreation. They need good stores and so on. And he, along with Bo Rapport, were Jewish Americans, and uh, they supported Israel, but they saw the oppression of the Palestinians. And and Bo Rapport supported educational programs. He would cuddle Palestinian youngsters when he went over there. And Saul Price would support job uh, training programs for Mm -hmm. Palestinians. They got a lot of flack. That's another characteristic. They could care less. They were very strong, uh, self-contained uh, personalities. They weren't flamboyant or arrogant, but they weren't going to let uh, their business peers sandpaper their conscience. I have a few questions here from A, who um, I'm going to I'm going to gravitate to this one because I think it's an interesting um, because you celebrate such 
such good people here. Um, most of the CEOs you featured have passed away. Um, are there any other living CEOs that like barely missed the cut? And I do think you addressed this in the opening, in the intro of your of your book, that there are a few people you might have included. Yes, there are, there are. There are some companies who do the right thing for some of their products, but not for others. Uh, so I didn't include them. These are more complete performances in uh, the rebellious CEO book. Um, as far as others are concerned, as I said uh, earlier, mm -hmm. I'm not the best person to ask. Uh, th there may be in the last 10, 15 years, people who've come along and are trying to do it right. They haven't yet publicly surfaced. Once in a while, you'll have NPR, you know, profile a small business who does it in a great way. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to scale it up a bit. Right. And while we fully admit there's some wonderful small businesses, all communities all over the country, uh, the test starts uh, when you scale it up and you can still keep a conscientious right. business underway uh, for replicable purposes. So for for our leaders who are um, who didn't make the cut or are just um, are looking for ways to to connect uh, the business to the, to the person. Um, Janet Joy is suggesting that I read the final line of the book, which is as one mega billionaire confessed to me, quote, we know how to make a lot of money, but we don't have a clue what to do with it. Including him. Yeah. What would you advise them to spend that money on first? Like, like what's, what's the, what's the most impact? Simple, you abolish poverty by having a living wage, full health insurance for everybody, retirement, and um, a number of other simple things that Western Europe and the Canadians have, paid family leave, paid child care, and, and just like that. You, you abolish the kind of poverty we've had for millions of Americans. Good food, make sure mm -hmm. that the children are properly uh, fed. Uh, protecting them against uh, environmental and other hazards. Uh, it's not that hard. Uh, if big business put a few billion dollars in instead of using it for stock buybacks and got Congress and the state legislatures to do it, it get done. Who's going to be against it? Once you have full-time civic advocates swarming over the legislators the way the corporate lobbyists do, it's unbeatable because you have left-right support, conservative mm -hmm. liberal support. They want the same things for their children. They don't want a dire poverty in a land of great wealth where the top 200 mega billionaires make as much, uh, have as much wealth as half of the country, the bottom half of the country, or even uh, more of a ratio like that. I mean, the head of Apple, Tim Cook, uh, a, a year or so ago was making $833 a minute, a minute on a 40 hour week, not counting benefits and perks. Uh, and he's paying his workers in Apple stores 20 bucks an hour at that time. So, you know, it, that's what I would do. I once uh, developed an idea called a gift year to America. So oh. the people who were born, say, 1940 or 1946 mm -hmm. or 1950 or 1936, they would get together, enough of them from around the country, it would have mm -hmm. been some rich people, and they'd give a permanent gift to America. Like the, one could be arboretums in communities all over the country. You teach the, the citizens and children about nature, the way Carnegie built libraries, 5,000 of them all over the country. Once the communities yeah. donated the land. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I put all these ideas for a gift year, maybe 30 of them, in, in a full page ad in the Baltimore Sun. Oh, wow. And I didn't get one response. Because see, they don't think that way. Yeah, they don't think in terms of institutional charity. They mm -hmm. think, well, we're going to build a, a dorm building in my alma mater, uh, or, with or my help, name on it. Yeah, or or help a food kitchen. Well, all that's mm -hmm. important, but that that's not institutional charity, and it certainly isn't justice. So there are a lot of ideas. If the person asking the question can can go to. Uh, info at csrl.org. We'll send them the, the Baltimore Sun ad with all the ideas, campaign finance reform, mm -hmm. living wage, getting people to learn 
how to form cooperatives, for example, uh, all the various long overdue just parts of our frontier that we should have adopted a long time ago if we had a strong democracy instead of a uh, plutocracy wedded to an oligarchy, to use fancy words. Yeah. So um, I, what year was that that you, that you published that in the Boston? About 10 years ago. Okay. You know, I, as I'm listening to you talk, I think it, what is maybe some people wouldn't draw this conclusion. You can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but but um, it, so it sounds to me like you have the inherent soul of an optimist. Like, and that's something that drives, needs to drive these leaders to create these kinds of investments and make these kinds of changes is to believe that what it is that they're doing can make a difference. Would you agree that that there has to be, even if, if one criticizes, um, the their current industry or the infrastructure or the complexes that you have to be optimistic yeah i mean pessimism and cynicism have no function in life other than to make their pr uh, promoters think they're smart that's all <laughs> so optimism you, you don't want to be pollyannish about it but optimism uh, doesn't prejudge success or failure it says we, we've got to persist. And uh, my optimism comes from the, the successes we had in the 60s and 70s. Mm. Before the media started blacking us out. Uh, we had tremendous success. We regulated the auto companies, saved mm -hmm. millions of lives and spread all over the world in terms of the safety systems and, and devices and the recall requirements. And we uh, instrumental in Freedom of, of Information Act in 1974 so people can enforce it and get uh, information from government that's locked up in files, you see. And we food safety was another one, and the Clean Air Act, and the Water Pollution Act, and so on. We had a modestly responsive gut Congress, which we don't have now, because we gave up on ourselves as citizens. We didn't hold on to the reins and say, look, the Constitution starts with we the people, not we the Congress, we the corporation. We're giving you our delegated authorities under our constitution. And we expect you to respect that authority and not sell or rent the US Congress to 1500 corporations who don't have a vote, by the way, not yet. <laughs> not yet, right. Um, I'm gonna get through two, I'm gonna do two questions here and then I think our our time is up. I've got Soful here and Kim Austin. Soful says, thank you for your life service. Um, also in another um, comment, request whether they you can write a next book about uh, ethical investing. So keep that in mind, put that in the parking lot. But um, they ask, I'm wondering if you view this book as a concession or compromise in any way amongst corporate control, or do you view it as integral? Why this book needs to come now? Because I think the behavior of giant corporations run by the CEOs has rarely been uh, as perilous as it is now. It's not just global climate change, which is serious enough. Mm -hmm. It's almost every area now in our society is commercialized. These companies used to have boundaries. You never sold directly to kids undermining parental mm -hmm. authority. Now they do it. It's a half a trillion dollar business, direct marketing. And... Uh, they, they want to corporatize education, commercialize everything they touch. They want to commercialize. They see profit because it's all profit. Every major religion in the world told his adherents, do not give too much power to the merchant class. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it runs roughshod over all kinds of civic values that are far more important. And what we should try to do in this uh, planet and fulfill life's possibilities. So that what is it that they learned to over 2000 years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, the money lenders making money from right. money and a serious, usurious interest payments and so on. So we, we have to subordinate commercial values to civic values. That every time we progress in our country, like abolishing child labor, mm -hmm. we subordinated cheap labor uh, to to, we subordinated cheap labor to civic supremacy, saying these kids should go to school, hire their parents, don't put these kids in factory dungeons. Mm -hmm. And what we've done now is we've allowed commercialism. They're, these these companies are are teaching kids how to gamble. 
60% of high school students admitted last year, they were doing internet gambling. Mm-hmm. 60%. They're, they're teaching kids how to, how to seducing them into eating junk foods and the obesity epidemic, for example. They're teaching kids to bypass their parents. In fact, in Madison Avenue advertisements, they have the phrase, become the corporate parent. And think about what that means oh, in terms yeah. of radicalism, extremism. Uh, and so we have got to subordinate the corporations to the supremacy of real human beings. You cannot have equal justice under law if an artificial entity yeah. like a corporation that doesn't feel shame or guilt or, you know, has, it has just profits in mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you can't have it equal on an equal plane. You've got to subordinate it to the supremacy of our civic and moral uh, uh, values. And that's the lesson of American history. It's a lesson of the world when you subordinate it. As Amory Lovins once said, markets make good servants, but bad masters. I think this might actually, you may have just answered Kim's question here too, that she asked why our CEOs like like the rebels that you that you include in your book in such short supply, it seems that operating a business in such a fair way um, or with this sort of attention to, to civic responsibility would be more beneficial for all. So what's the shortcut that's happening here? Well, I think there are companies trying to go to a carbon neutral, mid-sized companies, the kind of companies that used to be part of a group called Social Venture Network or Businesses for Social Responsibility. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's, for example, but they, mm-hmm. they did sell to Unilever uh, and became a subsidiary and they essentially left the company except to become consultants. So there are, I mean, you can, you look around, you'll be able to find, uh, you know, websites that will, will lead you to that. Uh, what I want to emphasize is there, there, there hasn't been a single major justice movement in our country that has required any more than 1% of active citizens representing public opinion, knowing mm-hmm. what they're talking about, and focusing on the decisional arena, like a state legislature or the Congress, they can overwhelm these corporations. People say, what? Well, that's not true. It can't happen. It's all pie in the sky. Well, right. I wrote a little book called Breaking Through Power. It's easier than we think, full of examples like that. In fact, we regulated the auto industry for emission control, fuel efficiency, and safety. We never had more than a thousand active people around the country. Why? Because we knew what we were talking about. They were suppressing safety devices, et cetera, Mm -hmm. inside whistleblowers. We focused on the key committees in Congress. We connected with the media. And we knew the motorists were on our side. If only they want to protect their kids. And what was then the fourth leading cause of death in America on the highways. So breaking through power is easier than we think. The problem is our educational system doesn't give us civic skills. Mm -hmm. We teach civics anymore in uh, elementary school and high school. And therefore, the children know how to use computers, but they don't know how to practice democracy. Mm -hmm. They're computer literate, but they're not necessarily literate. And that's what we have to start with. And that's why my sister's book is so important. You are your own best teacher. Direct 50 topics that these children would love to talk about with their parents and with each other. That, that they know affect their lives every day, but they're not taught in the schools. So that book um, is a framework for young people. And this book is a framework for uh, leaders going forward. And um, first of all, I just wanna, I'm gonna quote Carlos Mendez here who wrote in our comments, uh, thank you, Mr. Nader, for your contributions to the quality of life to people all over the world. I think I think that's very um, well said and and apropos to all of the work that you've done. And I also want to wrap up our conversation. It's already five past four, so I guess we need to call it a day. But um, reaching back into the book and uh, the section on Paul Hawken, who um, said that one of the reasons that he is out there teaching his philosophy, just as perhaps you are too, um, is that he hopes that, quote, the seeds, or you write this, I'm sorry, about Paul Hawken, is that he, 
in the hopes that the seeds he and others have planted will foster a more just and sustainable society. And I think that is what this book does so well. It plants seeds in the hope that something good grows from them. Um, your entire catalog of books obviously is a contribution to that sort of civic learning that we all need to engage with. And I just wanna thank you for this book and for this challenge this planting that will no doubt allow us to harvest uh, for the good in the future. Well, Sally, thank you for this opportunity. I, I always love to talk in other than sound barks, sound <laughs> bites or sound barks. And, <laughs> and as far as Paul Hawkins goes, what I think is one of the greatest commencement speakers, one of oh. the greatest commencement speeches ever delivered to students in Portland, Oregon is heavily excerpted in this book. And he told me he wrote it overnight before the day of the commencement and threw oh. away his, his uh, standard speech. Mm -hmm. And you can see the it's tremendous inspiration. And he knows what he's talking about. So I, I hope we have a sign in our gift shop at the Tort Museum yeah. in Winston, Connecticut. It says, readers think, thinkers read. And we've really got to get back to reading, mm -hmm. not just snippets or, you know, little things on the internet. Uh, reading thinking leads to civic action. Nothing can stop the civic movement. And all have, you have to have is up to 1% in the congressional districts, knowing what they're talking about, knowing that they represent public opinion, a lot of left-right support for all kinds of things, and focusing on the lawmakers. And there aren't that many of them, just 535 of them in Congress. About a third of them are on our side to begin with. There's that optimism again. And I think we'll we'll go ahead and close on that. And I just want to thank you again. It was an honor to talk to you. And um, good luck with the book. Thank you. We're going to need good luck. Good news doesn't seem to be widely recognized these days in the mass media. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep getting it out there, right? That's right. Talk it up. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.